All right, hey everyone, uh, thanks for coming. So uh, let me introduce the speaker. So this is Maria Gorlitova. She's an assistant, prof uh, assistant professor at um, Duke and she has some title, I think the Nortel Networks Professor, <laughs> Institute Professor. Um, she does really cool work at the intersection of in, um, IoT, edge computing and augmented and virtual reality. Um, she's won like a whole bunch of awards. You can see all the agencies that have you know, funded her research. Uh, I know she's won the DARPA YFA award and NSF Career Award. So. We're really glad to have her. And just a small anecdote, like I've known Maria for a long time. I knew her since I was an undergrad and she was the PhD student in that group and I've always looked up to her. So I'm really glad to have her here to present for us today. Oh, thank you, Jesse. That's so, uh, thank you. Um, I've uh, I've looked up to you for years as well, by the way. So you, because your your work has been foundational for the field, truly. Um, so, so um, yeah, so uh, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, it's absolutely, uh, absolute delight to be here. As introduced, I am a Nortel Networks Assistant Professor of uh, ECE at uh, Duke with a secondary appointment in the CS uh, department. Um, previously, I was uh, my PhD is from Columbia. Uh, this is where we first met. Uh, so there's a caption thing. I want to remove it from. Oh, yeah. Uh, where's your mouse? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, yeah, please come All good? Um, yeah, so, so my PhD is from Columbia. I worked in Princeton as a postdoctoral research scholar, and uh, I've also spent quite a bit of time in industry where I had the pleasure of uh, being affiliated with the companies that are shown on the screen uh, here. One of them is uh, Disney Research, where I got exposed to the work that the computer graphics community does, and that uh, impacted my uh, uh, career directions uh, subsequently. So. Uh, at Duke, I lead the, the Intelligent Interactive IoT Lab. We have about uh, eight PhD students, and we are huge believers in undergraduate research as well. So we have a vast number of uh, undergraduate projects uh, every semester. We are actively hiring. The hiring for this year is just about over, but we will be hiring next year as well. And we also have an opening for a postdoc if you know anyone who is looking for a position that uh, can start as soon as uh, fall of uh, this year. So the goal of our work uh, is the core research direction that we are pursuing is uh, making augmented reality reliable and context aware. So augmented reality systems like HoloLens or AR on mobile platforms, they, they already exist, but they are, Toys. They have uh, many limitations. So our vision is to make them truly reliable and reliable in a cyber physical uh, systems uh, perspective. That they are as they should be uh, so trustworthy that you would trust your life to them. So that you would trust them to be a part of surgery that is done on you, or trust them in guiding you in working with a large and dangerous robot. And for for the context awareness, we talk about augmented reality experiences that's not just graphics floating in the air. This is augmented reality that uh, responds to the state of the environment and the state of the user. And uh, I'll go into much more detail of that later in this uh, talk. Yes. We are we are very decidedly a computer systems research lab. So we are not a UX lab. We do not consider AR system in isolation. Rather, we consider AR in context of uh, its environment and interactions with its user. And in collaboration with, uh, with different research, with different infrastructures that can support it. A lot of our work relies on uh, edge computing, that is uh, computationally capable devices placed in the proximity of uh, uh, of augmented reality systems. This is the work that uh, we started back in Princeton. Right now, we are part of an NSF uh, AI Institute that uh, creates edge computing systems of the future. So just about all the architectures that we create have um, edge computing as part of, of, of uh, their functionality. We also have some work that uses other supporting infrastructures for augmented reality. So for instance, we place helper sensors and actuators in the environment, and we can see how this additional information or additional control can be used to optimize the performance of augmented reality systems. So let me start 
the stock with the definition of uh, well, uh, of augmented reality and its current state. And for the sake of the stock, I <clears throat> want to draw a very sharp distinction between augmented and virtual reality. Virtual reality places user in a fully virtual world. And augmented reality takes the real world around the user and places virtual content in, in that world. So the two technologies have lots of similarities, but they have uh, fundamental differences as well. Uh, perception of the real world is much more important for AR than for VR. Some examples of specifically AR experiences are shown on the screen here. So the very left is the IKEA Place app that allows you to place furniture in context of the room of your choice. To the middle is the Google Translate app that takes pixels in a foreign language and replaces them with the pixels in the language of your choosing. And to the right is an example of uh, New York Times uh, media team's experience with augmented reality, that they uh, were figuring out how to incorporate immersive multimedia into their coverage of news. So this is an example of the experiences they created for Winter Olympics, that you could take a virtual representation of an athlete, and you could put that effort in context of the world around you. So you could put them in your cubicle or next to you in, in the classroom. Uh, and that's, uh, uh, by doing that, you can really see them in a way that you uh, don't see them from uh, 2D displays alone. So um, who has tried other augmented reality apps? What, what? <laughs> uh, what, what what kind of apps do have other people to have people try it here? Yes, please. Like when you buy stuff online, yes. For example, Sephora stuff is having you try on the shade or something. So yes. Money. Yes, perfect. Yes, there, there, there also uh, there are remodeling apps that allow you to try different uh, different types of tiles. Yes, uh, uh, things that are very close to this uh, IKEA place app for other types of uh, products. Uh, what else? What else have people tried? I've tried like furniture ones where like, you know, again, shopping, but they put, yeah. put like a sort of light fixture and you can change the size and stuff. In your Ooh. Room. Cool. Uh, who played Pokemon Go? <laughs> uh, just one person for one Pokemon Go player. <laughs> Uh, other experiences, other apps. Uh, so the one, uh, one fairly uh, niche but uh, quite interesting app is the the one that allows you to see uh, uh, constellations in the night sky. That you you point it at the night sky and you see uh, the map, uh, the constellation map or blade right there. So it's, it's pretty cool. Uh, anything else? Oh, cool. Real time. Sweet. That's that's really interesting because the information about the plane is actually very easy to get. So this is that, that's a cool app. Yeah, very nice. Yeah. Uh, what have you tried? <laughs> uh, the, the measure app on the app on the app. Very nice. Yeah, measure app. That's right. That's right. cool. Cool. Um, yeah. So uh, this is so these are all examples of specifically augmented reality experiences. So the experience where the state of the real world and the state of uh, the augmentation they they go together. So you're not placed in a fully virtual world, but you are still in the real world and the experience is uh, altered for you. So augmented reality has been studied in the labs uh, forever, uh, since 1970s, but it has reached the consumers only very recently. So the dates that you see on the screen are the dates for, uh, release dates for uh, commercial headsets, as well as early release dates for the SDKs that allow for AR experiences on uh, mobile phones. And you see that this is all uh, within the last six or so years. And uh, the augmented reality has been expanding in capabilities uh, since then. So early SDKs have only worked on highest uh, quality mobile platforms. And then since the availability has been expanding. So overall, while uh, augmented reality via headsets is uh, its availability is somewhat restricted due to the pricing of the headsets uh, and various other factors. Augmented reality via a mobile phone is accessible to literally billions uh, by now. 
and it's been a very interesting time in this uh, <clears throat> in this industry as well. So I uh, mentioned drawing a sharp distinction between AR and VR. But the recent trend is to have VR headsets that have some AR capabilities. So while they are creating, uh, they're capable of creating a VR experience, they're also capable of capturing the state of the real world and uh, adding augmentation to it. These are the two products that uh, are arguably fairly important. And note that the release dates for them are fairly, fairly recent. So this is from last October to uh, February. So this is uh, an interesting time for this community. Uh, what you see on the screen here is an example of somebody wearing a MetaQuest. And uh, this is this is Dharma Program Manager. He's having a conversation with, uh, with a student in my lab who some of you have, uh, have met. And uh, note that they're having a conversation. So the reason why they're able to do that is because this headset has a see-through mode that allows you, you can put a person in a fully virtual world there, but you can also have them uh, see the world in fairly a fairly extensive detail. So this this is this is important. And uh, Apple Vision Pro uh, has some important capabilities uh, as well. So it's a very exciting time for this uh, community as a whole. Um, AR applications, uh, many applications have been envisioned, and arguably, uh, um, arguably the most important ones uh, fall under the category of uh, showing the invisible, uh, showing the user the information exactly where she needs it in space. So this example of showing where the planes are in the sky, that's that's a very, uh, this is an example of exactly that. You cannot see those airplanes with the naked eye, but you can use AR for showing that to the user. Uh, some examples that are of this Category. Uh, for instance, if you are working on a printed circuit board and you can have the pinout diagram displayed right there where you need it. Or if you are working with a robot, then uh, augmented reality can be used to show the intended path of the robot or the safety zone around the robot. So there's also this idea of showing information exactly where it belongs in space. Uh, Apple likes this uh, terminology of uh, spatial computing I think this gets across the core ideas uh, quite well. Uh, augmented reality has a lot of applications in medicine. Um, from uh, patient education to uh, rehabilitation guidance, what, what Jesse has uh, some exciting work on, to intraoperative support. Uh, we've been working with some clinical experts on bringing that to Realities. So let me talk for a little bit about one specific area of work. And this is augmented reality for neurosurgery and neurosurgical training. Um, neurosurgery is considered a classical use case for augmented reality as uh, neurosurgeons try to cut the patient's brain as little as possible. And they try to open the brain as little as possible. So what this means in reality is that in many cases, they are operating blind. That what they see in front of them as they are performing uh, surgery is a, uh, they, they see a patient, they see the, the patient's skull, they, um, they create small holes in that skull. And then they try to get to the right part of the brain via those small holes without actually seeing where they're going. So let's say that they have, uh, this is an example of a catheter placement where the surgeon tries to get to a specific part of the ventricular system to release uh, pressure on the brain. So here the surgeon drills small holes uh, within a skull and then they enter a catheter through that hole. They have a preoperative CT scan of the patient that's next to the, uh, them somewhere. And they, uh, they effectively, they, they call it freehand. They go in blind. That they, uh, they operate based on uh, anatomical landmarks and their uh, experience with this procedure. Uh, this is obviously um, challenging. It's uh, harder for junior neurosurgeons. And it is harder for cases where patient's anatomy is non-standard. So the goal of augmented reality here is to no longer have surgeons going in blind. You create a hologram out of preoperative scan of the patient, and you put that hologram 
exactly where the corresponding part of the patient's anatomy is. So here you align as well as you can the hologram with where this ventricular system is. And then the surgeon can operate now, not just on some reprojection of the CT scan that they see next to them, but they literally see what they are targeting. And it has been shown across multiple studies that this, uh, that this is very helpful, that this helps uh, improve their targeting if, if it's done like that with a guided approach. This has been demonstrated before. We're not the only people who have done it. Uh, what we have been playing with in this space is uh, what external support infrastructures can do for you. So for instance, uh, what can you do here with uh, gaze tracking? What uh, can you do with uh, gesture recognition? Uh, how you can use uh, the fact that you, uh, you can track the position of the surgical tool, that you can provide guidance, for instance. Then it's not just that you place the hologram where the surgeon is supposed to be targeting, but you also put the, you suggest the right trajectory. And this, uh, so again, we've demonstrated that this works, uh, this works fairly, uh, this, this works well, this, this helps. One um, side product of uh, this work, we, uh, we got to the point where we uh, wanted to do studies with different types of AR guidance here. And we realized that the bottleneck for those studies is that you have to do uh, 3D scans of the quality of uh, tool insertion for every trial that somebody does. So the state of the art here is that you if you want to evaluate how well a procedure is going. You have this brain. A uh, surgeon targets the brain. They, um, they insert the tool how they are instructed to do. They leave that tool within the brain. And then you take that down to the CT scanning uh, facility. And this is how you measure how close they got to the target. Uh, this procedure is extremely cumbersome and uh, very expensive as well. And in places, uh, very hard limits on how many users you will work with and how many types of uh, guidance you will evaluate since it's truly is very uh, complicated procedure. So what we have done in our work is to instead create a system where we use cameras uh, to look inside this the skull and to see where the surgeon is placing the catheter within the skull. So this is a fairly simple application of uh, an IoT uh, sensing. This uh, allows you to, you, you basically have to, uh, a very, very capable undergraduate student can do that easily. It's not uh, that, that hard to create, but this solves a very real issue for the system. So now that you do not have to go down to the, to the scanner for every trial that you run, you can actually, <clears throat> Many more trials, and you can experiment with many more types of AR guidance. So, in our recent work that appeared in uh, the journal uh, uh, Neurosurgical Communities Journal, uh, Neurosurgery Focus, in that work we um, experimented with guidance for the whole drilling part of this procedure. So, we actually had the users. Uh, drill the holes in those simulated skulls for under different types of guidance. And we were able to do that for 200 trials. So that's, that, that was unprecedented without this type of uh, sensing solution helping in evaluating uh, the system. Uh, coincidentally, this uh, being able to assess the accuracy in real time here has this uh, side benefit of making for very cool demos. Because now you do not have to wait until the brain comes back from the scanner to see how well you're doing. You can do it, you can see it in real time. So this is a photo of the director of the NSF uh, trying to see how well he targets a zone within the human brain as part of the Athena showcase that uh, we did last uh, September. So this is real time uh, uh, cool demo because you, you really can't see how well you're doing in real time. Uh, any questions so far?
I can ask two like maybe general audience type oh. questions. So, uh, the brain is something deforms. Are you just like using the static CT scan, or are you like trying to model deformations in the brain as well? Yeah. So, so this is a this is a type of a procedure where the assumption is that you take the CT scan, you 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 segment it right away, you and you take the patient uh, and and you do the surgery right away. So the assumption is that the brain would not change. In, in that period of time. Uh, indeed, if you have to do operations where uh, things shift during the procedure uh, or where things just, or if the CT scan is no longer, no longer fully corresponds to the state of the patient, this is, this is harder. Yeah, that, that's one of the challenges here. Maybe the other. Yeah, no, this is, uh, um, in general, defor deformation, so, the registration issue here is largely um, can be solved. Like the, you, you can do this. This is easy. Deformation is indeed still challenging. This is why a lot of experiments with uh, AR guidance they really focus on non-deforming structures. So, for instance, uh, dentistry is a great one. That uh, truly in dentistry things are as stable as can be. <laughs> like it's bone on bone. So yeah, but if you want to do abdominal surgery, then yeah, that has limitations. And my other question is maybe this is not relevant to brain, but like, uh, can you combine multiple modalities? And if you have some real time information about the brain, is it easy to in real time process this information and put it in the hologram? You probably could. So, so this this will be going down the route of uh, effectively creating digital twins and then building some kind of a physics based model that changes those twins in some way. Uh, you could definitely go down that route. Uh, this is uh, uh, we we are going down the route of uh, digital twins for for other reasons. Uh, it's uh, it's definitely a future that that is worth uh, considering. We we don't do this, but it's, it's really interesting and uh, promising. Uh, any other questions? Something in the chat. Oh, uh, yes. So, so are the camera binocular? Oh, so in this case, so these are these are multi. They, we have multiple cameras, and they are the uh, wide field of view cameras. So that's how you get three D here. Um, so yeah, also, and this is this is open source, by the way. So if uh, if anyone has questions, we have a repository that uh, that has all the details, including the all of the the entire hardware uh, setup. Um, so yeah, what it, uh, um, I really enjoyed the part of this experience where we were yes yes I will send the link yes uh, yes if there is a good way of doing that. Is there uh, so, uh, somebody's asking about the link for the repo? Uh. I'll save their name. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I really like that we could. Uh, uh, so, so this uh, the sensing solution is fairly straightforward, but it enabled work that actually appeared in the medical venue. So, the, it enabled uh, evaluating AR in a way that that is meaningful. And the student who has been leading this work uh, recently secured an internship at the. Uh, XR group of the of the FDA that uh, FDA uh, wants to work on methods of evaluating XR experiences, and this is uh, this is what uh, this goes along the lines of what they would like to create, which I think is uh, interesting. So, but to to take a step uh, uh, away from uh, specific medical procedures, um, these are the quotes from leaders of companies that have been driving AR or, or XR as a whole. And uh, these people have uh, built their companies on this technology. And note that they are not talking about AR as in a restricted surgical use case, or they're not talking about AR in a restricted human-robot uh, interaction use case. They talk about AR as a pervasive technology, as something that you use daily uh, in for many, many tasks. And uh, the question is, so these are, this is the vision. This is what they say when they stay in front of uh, the 10 year roadmaps. So how far we are from this? And 
people from different communities would give you give you different answers. So somebody who does graphics would answer this differently uh, than somebody like uh, Jesse or myself. Uh, so my answer is here that uh, resource limitations con continue to be uh, a huge issue for these devices. They run out of uh, battery uh, very quickly. They overheat very quickly. They are they're just not there as pervasive uh, uh, devices in that way. Security and privacy are a huge challenge in the space. Uh, those devices are, they introduce new attack vectors. They are, they collect a lot of information about the user. So the, there is a whole bunch of risks here that uh, need to be addressed. Uh, I have a separate award that uh, specifically focuses on some of those issues. So I'm not uh, discussing that, but uh, uh, talk to me separately if, if you're interested in that one. And, um, the other limitations is that you want those devices to be much more aware of the state of the environment and the state of the user as they are than they are right now. And you want that context awareness to be robust. And this is what I'll talk about in the rest of this talk. So and let's first talk about the environmental awareness for AR, or specifically starting with spatial awareness. And this is the device's understanding of uh, where it is in space. Uh, this is absolutely foundational for specifically augmented reality. For the augmented reality to be able to create an object in space and have the object stay there as the user moves, it has to have a very clear understanding of its own motion. So as uh, if I place an object on the laptop right now, and as I move my head out away from it, if I am not obtaining the best estimate of the motion of my head, the object will appear to have shifted. And this, uh, this is foundationally bad for all sorts of use cases. Uh, so devices need the, their position and orientation both. And if you worked with other types of localization, uh, just note that here the extent of uh, knowledge of the environment that the devices require is much more fine-grained than for smart cars, for instance. So we really want to know the pose of the device at the sub-centimeter and sub-degree level. Usually this is achieved uh, with uh, visual inertial slump and that takes inputs from the uh, IMU of uh, the device and from the camera of the device and uh, results in those uh, pose estimates. Uh, VI SLAM is, uh, this is the magic that brought AR to commercial devices. This, uh, so it, it works amazingly well, but it also doesn't work all that well because it's complex, it's resource intensive, and it still has lots of issues uh, in many different environments under many different conditions. And uh, AR is a technology that you wear on your head. So the errors in SLAM directly translate to, to artifacts that the user sees. Some of them could be this uh, unattended device motion. So we placed a virtual lamp in one part of the table and uh, it uh, moves to the other part of the table or somewhere else entirely, for instance. And uh, incorrect scale is another issue that, that is common, that uh, objects can appear either gigantic or infinitesimal. Uh, because of a poor depth uh, uh, estimates. So those of you who try VR apps, do any of these look familiar? Have, have you seen them? Yeah, oh, what, what, what comes to mind? Something's wrong that I, uh, I'm not getting too much like, confidence in that app. Yes, yes, yes. So what, what's frustrating about this use case is that for a lot of apps, the getting the scaling right is actually the core point of the app. Like if you want to see if the furniture fits in your space, the scale has to be correct. <laughs> if, if the, or for the measure app, if the scale is wrong, the, the app isn't helpful. So this, this is one issue that uh, uh, it basically it undermines your, a, lot, a lot of potential use cases for these types of uh, applications. And uh, 
The second type of uh, environmental awareness that uh, is not as foundational for AR, but it is also uh, very important uh, for many applications. This is uh, being able to understand objects and surfaces in the space around the user, uh, semantic understanding. Uh, so a lot of this uh, could be uh, uh, classical computer vision uh, tasks, uh, object detection, scene segmentation, uh, various others. And uh, I really like this quote from uh, from a paper that I that you believe you are uh, relatively recently that the performance of data sets and the performance all in the real world are very different for these uh, applications. You have. Um, uh, you have many, many reasons for this. One is that uh, you have the so-called uh, domain mismatches, that whatever whatever the model is trained on is does not actually correspond to what you see uh, uh, captured by the AR device camera, that uh, image quality could be worse, your, your camera pose is different, uh, uh, lots of different issues. The other case is that by default, you are operating in a so-called open set conditions, that you're never in a scenario where you are only taking images of cats and dogs. You are always in a case where as you capture the world, as your hand moves around the world, you're, you capture the scene in every which way, in whatever angle, whatever, whatever happens to be in space is what your camera captures. So this open set condition is very challenging for a lot of these uh, algorithms. And then you have this issue of uh, resource limitations that uh, you want these uh, very complex algorithms working well under in the mobile form factor. And you want them working quickly as well. So to be able to create an augmentation that corresponds to the state of the real world, you want that working in somewhat close to real time. And this is where, Edge computing has become the de facto standard solution for implementing complex capabilities on these devices. Uh, just about all that we do uses this external edge servers, and we are far from the only ones who do that. Uh, for instance, this work over here, this is a paper that uh, appeared in um, IEEE ISMAR a couple of years ago, and this demonstrates how to replace in augmented reality certain objects uh, with, vir with virtual objects. So in this case, they are taking cars and pedestrians and they're replacing them with uh, well, 3D models, bees in this case. So for this scenario, they, um, they actually had to do both uh, the scene understanding and rendering on, both on edge servers, since uh, this, is, uh, this is fairly heavy in, in terms of both, that you want uh, the objects on mobile, you have to, you have to detect them, you have to track them, and you have to do it reliably in, in this wider wider world. Um, yeah, of course. I like that quote. Like, did they talk about some examples of what they mean by unusable? Okay. Um, yeah. Um, I think, uh, so they have, uh, this is, a, I believe this is from the BS Holler group uh, in uh, UC Santa Barbara. And uh, by unusable, they meant that uh, um, if you try, my understanding of this is that if you try to build an app that relies on your uh, detecting a chair in space and doing something with that chair, that if you want to just create an API that does that, then uh, the apps uh, don't really work. Uh, so half the chairs are undetected and half the chairs are, yeah, like, and, and it's, it's extremely frustrating for the users since you uh, get no interaction with the objects that you want or you get some random guesses, basically. I wonder if there's any, like, yeah, how to correlate to user? Like, what is the user requirement for these things? Like, well, one yes, of yes. There's actually a really, really interesting paper that appeared in Kai last year that uh, looked at some of the um, some of the implications of this. That uh, let's we take as a, uh, the authors of the paper take as a given that uh, um, scene understanding models will make mistakes, and they see how they are they take different approaches to solving this that keep users in mind. For instance, uh, what if we try to be more back in in our uh, in how we let users interact with certain things? What if we take confidence into account? All of those things. So it's it's, it's quite it's quite interesting. Uh, for the for for the for the demo, uh, is it gas? Where, where is the edge? So in this case, so the, these authors are in. Um, 
Nanti Zurich, and Zurich has a very good data center just about there. So their edge is actually um, uh, a cloud center that is co-located with them. So it's, uh, they, they're very, very close edge-wise. So the, the, the ad have uh, like uh, wireless cellular communication with the edge? I mean, for the, the edge is uh, used yeah. for the computation part? So I don't recall whether this is cellular or Wi-Fi. Uh, I don't recall. I, I can look that up in the paper. Um, but it's cellular. It's either cellular or Wi-Fi. And then going down the standard network route to to the their local cloud center. Yeah. So, so my question is, I'm curious how you guarantee the end-to-end -end latency for this uh, rendering stuff. Is this real time or? Yeah. So you. <sighs> Uh, the short answer that you you I don't know, Jesse might know some of this better than I do, but my understanding is that no one has come up with a way of guaranteeing latency. That you are you always uh, you can target the latency and then you can measure it and then you can build your system so that they work well at different levels of this curve. Uh, I think uh, coming up with guarantees for latency is uh, research. From what I understand, it's it's an open. Okay. And you do better. The closer you put your edge, the better. If you actually place it uh, one hope, it's better. But there are always issues. Um, so there are different, way, different ways of using edge in this case. Uh, we have recently um, we've recently done a line of work where we um, we uh, we solve uh, to solve this general issue of. Uh, the main mismatches. Uh, we, we create a system that where we collect local data to inform model training. Fairly straightforward that we collect some scenario specific data for training the model that we need. But the issue is that uh, if you try to do that for a new set of uh, for, for a new environment, and you don't know how how to collect the data, so you don't know how to collect the data that you need to train the model well, especially if your data collectors are non-experts. So we developed a system where we uh, create, uh, we obtain real-time estimates of the value of the data that we are collecting. And we're using those estimates to guide the user on their data collection. In this case, we wanted to work, uh, we wanted to create an AR app that works in our wildlife center. So we want to detect an animal there and create an AR experience that is based on the species of that animal. And this is what the wildlife data center captures look like. So if you try to take an off-the-shelf model and run it there, you get random noise. So you need some of the local data and we've uh, demonstrated that uh, this kind of guided data collection uh, helps you do much better on in terms of the quality of the data that that you get. Uh, but overall, a lot of uh, the point about latency and uh, other performance measures in this space. Um, by and large, I would say that uh, a lot of the work on edge computing right now is somewhat reduced to engineering problems of getting it to work. Like you decide what needs to go on the edge, you decide to go what needs to go on the cloud, and you uh, tweak parameters here and there to get it to work well. And then um, there are some cases that are more, uh, more interesting and more, uh, shall we say, rigorous. Uh, for instance, in this work, we uh, were experimenting with ways of uh, using edge for growing the performance of SLAM systems. So, and a couple of recent lines of work, a SLAM has been partitioned such that parts that you need for autonomous operation stay on the device. And then the computationally heavy tasks are placed on the edge server. And uh, what our work has added to that is uh, uh, those two blocks shown in purple that allow you to optimally select what information gets transmitted to the edge and to use the best information locally for the creation of this local map that you use for immediate operations. The idea here is that we use uh, effectively, effectively map uncertainty quantification, that we, we 
use information that uh, does most to improve the quality of the map that, that we have. And uh, one of the contributions of this work is that we created low complexity algorithms that enable this type of framework uncertainty quantification to run in real time. And our results, uh, the system is called the Lab. Our results in comparison to some baselines are shown here. And here, lower is better. So when we are able to do this intelligent selection of uh, what is transmitted and what is used, we achieve much better performance uh, compared to baselines. And uh, <clears throat> So for robust environmental awareness, uh, it is one of the solutions, but uh, arguably it's not the only solution. <laughs> In fact, uh, I think that uh, we're just not building the systems right. So when we're building SLAM, the approach to doing it right now is that we take a data set and we try to have a model or an algorithm do well on that data set. And this is foundational limiting since uh, this type of operation doesn't capture what happens if uh, the environment changes or what happens if you have two users and they are seeing similar but different inputs from the environment or what happens as uh, how does the user feel about the, the performance of, <laughs> of uh, a, a certain algorithm. So the data set evaluation is only just limited. What we've been experimenting with is an alternative approach where we build virtual environments and uh, we use those virtual environments to put uh, algorithms there. And um, we modify the state of the environment so that we get a sense of the performance of the algorithm under different conditions. And then we take those same virtual environments. Uh, we create VR experiences out of them and we put users in those VR experiences. So this allows us to look at the same time at the performance of uh, algorithms and uh, user stake on the environment both to co-analyze this uh, human and machine perception. Uh, we first published this at uh, Jubilee Ismar a couple of years ago and have uh, since been building up on this. Uh, for instance, in uh, ICR this year, we have a paper coming up that uh, um, analyzes the type of VI slam point clouds that you get from different virtual environments. Uh, we modify the state of the environment and we see what effect that has on VI slam point clouds and on uh, AI systems' abilities to make inferences on top of that. And this line of work dovetailed into our recently funded project that, uh, that we're doing with Jesse and with our collaborator Carly, that, who was here a couple of weeks ago. Um, on this project, we're building virtual environments for emulating the state of the world and changes in the world. We are building emulation for resource constraints, a different part of the system for uh, on the device side, on the network side, and on the server side. And then we're using this to train algorithms that optimize resource efficiency and optimize performance for these systems. Uh, this is a four-year project. We just started it. Uh, we are very excited about it. Um, all of the PIs on this project are passionate about building tools for the community to use. So we not just want to build our algorithms here. We want to create uh, a system that allows other researchers to push this uh, forward as well. And uh, um, going even deeper than that, uh, we have edge. We uh, uh, we arguably can throw more resources at some of those problems to do better at them. And what I think is uh, fundamentally missing, though, is that uh, we uh, we actually do not know how well a certain algorithm is operating in a certain set of conditions. That uh, let's say that we put SLAM in a certain environment. We truly do not know if it's working well, if we should trust its estimates. If we know that it's not working well, then we can do all sorts of things to it. We can throw more resources to it. We can change the type of user guidance that we are generating. But the issue is that the model ways of assessing the performance of these algorithms are based on comparison with the ground truth. And ground truth just isn't available in the real world. 
So this area of uh, quality of experience metrics for AR is, in my opinion, dramatically understudied. It kind of falls in between uh, what different communities are doing. Uh, traditional multimedia communities uh, do think a lot in terms of metrics, but their metrics are different. They don't uh, consider this awareness of the state of uh, the real world, for instance. A lot of people who traditionally work on AR are, I uh, think, qualitatively rather than uh, quantitatively. And overall, a lot of this work requires metrics that run in real time on resource-constrained devices. And this is an area that uh, truly requires computer engineers, computer scientists to get right. Uh, this is where I want to mention again that we are hiring. I think this is a foundational area of work for many years to come. So if uh, this is interesting, uh, uh, awesome. So any questions? So I have a quick slide about, um, about error estimates in the real world. Uh, basically, here we created a system that allows you to visualize how well SLAM is likely to be doing in different parts of the space. So this is based on uh, the idea of uh, taking a trajectory and rerunning its estimates multiple times uh, on the idea of uncertainty of propagation. This is not exactly a real-time metric that we get here, but uh, it's a step uh, towards it, and it's an AR app that uh, is useful in and of itself if you're designing an AR experience for a certain uh, area. But uh, I, have, uh, I have about 12 minutes left, uh, and I want to also talk briefly about the other part of uh, context awareness here. That is user context awareness. So and by user context awareness, I mean understanding what the user is doing and how the user is feeling. Uh, so in context of a surgical AR application, for instance, you can consider that uh, what if we know how, if the user is proficient in this task, then we can adapt our guidance to that. What if you know if the user is distracted and we can adapt the guidance accordingly. You can also think of experiences that are specifically tailored to modifying the state of the user. So for instance, uh, this is something that my collaborators at the BME department came up with, that uh, we uh, see that the, we sense that the user is getting hungry. And before they uh, get a chance to develop uh, craving for unhealthy food, you show them a healthy food option. Or if you here you detect that the user is uh, going to be using, considering starting to play with their phone, for instance, this is where you cover the phone with a hologram, and you place something in space that reminds the user of uh, why they shouldn't be doing this. So in this case, you show the user an example of uh, working to, what they're working towards, what they value. So they, you show them the diploma that they should be studying towards uh, instead of, <laughs> instead of <laughs> letting them play with the phone. So these are the kinds of things that you can do if you have user context awareness. <laughs> yes, please, of course. That's really interesting. So is the idea then to like, uh, trying their efficiency has an impact on their like long term, <laughs> long term effect. Or so my <clears throat> so my, my my overall what I want to do here, and, and this is uh, this this is challenging. Uh, I want to build a system that helps users maintain the state of the flow. That if uh, if they're in the flow, if they like the task, then we keep them there, and if they're not there, we we, we channel them there. So I don't have the ambition of. Uh, analyzing long-term effects of this, but rather just making sure that the user stays focused on the task. Uh, but even, even that is already it's challenging. And the challenges here are, well, there, there are opportunities, challenges and opportunities both. Uh, opportunities are that uh, augmented reality systems are intimately connected to the user, that they have, uh, they know where your head is. In many cases, they know where your eyes are. They uh, they know what what you see in the real world. They have extra, they should see more than you see uh, based on how their cameras are positioned. They hear what you hear, and uh, this is uh, they actually have to do that because to be able to merge virtual and real, they have to have a very uh, high level of understanding of the real world. So there is lots of opportunities here. Uh, wearables can be added to AR systems uh, nearly trivially. In terms of uh, just basic putting it together, putting wearables and AR devices uh, 
as part of the same system, it's it's trivial. It's a couple of days of work for for an undergrad student. Uh, the difficulties are that, uh, well, what's, uh, yeah, not so well kept secret in that community is that uh, population level models really do not work well for all of these tasks. That uh, uh, humans have different, humans are different. Humans are very heterogeneous. So if you're trying to detect somebody's uh, stress level, for instance, uh, what uh, looks as stress for some person is a baseline for another person. So if you try to build a population level model for recognizing some of these things, then that uh, uh, there's an uphill battle. On the other hand, if you know somebody's behavior, if you have someone's personal data, then you have a higher chance of building a good algorithm that actually works. You, um, the, the challenge of personalization comes the issue of uh, data collection, that you cannot collect a lot of user data for a lot of these uh, applications. So this is where you need to employ a few short learning, for instance. And a lot of this data is highly sensitive. So if you, uh, uh, in many cases, you won't be comfortable sharing some of that data. So this is where techniques like federated learning might be the right approach. So this is a good motivation for own device or own age learning uh, without transmitting the data to the global whole. Uh, we have been doing a lot of work with eye tracking. And uh, eye tracking is uh, it's an important part of AR and VR systems both. And it is a source of very, very powerful social information about the user. If you know how where the user is uh, Looking, you understand a lot about the user. You understand their interests. You understand their drives. You uh, you can detect somebody's proficiency on the task very easily from eye tracking data. Uh, eye tracking data can be used to detect certain conditions, uh, medical conditions, psychological conditions, uh, all sorts of things. And here, this is uh, the challenges are that this needs to whatever. Uh, you can clearly tell a lot about the user. You can detect a lot of the user state or expertise from uh, this type of data. But you have this challenges that it needs to work in few shot conditions and that the data you get from different uh, devices differs as well. Uh, so one method that we have built, uh, it uh, takes uh, eye tracking data. And rather than uh, treating it as the as a sequence of uh, x, y coordinates, we model it as graphs that uh, preserve the core properties of uh, the visual information while discarding some of the data that's uh, uh, some of the information that's there, but that's not representative of this behavior. And we have demonstrated that this type of uh, treatment of visual data works very well. It uh, outperforms uh, other methods uh, considerably. Uh, we've also built that to, we've demonstrated working in context of an AR app, that we detect that the user is reading text or viewing painting, and we show them the augmentation accordingly. This is implemented on the Magic Leap. Uh, here you have uh, information transmitted to the edge server, the, Inference running on the H server and the results transmitted back to the Magic Leap for for uh, uh, adapting the augmentation and uh, the latency here is okay. Like users are okay with this latency. It's not uh, not what you would want for some other application, but for this one, it works well. And then uh, another line of work that I wanted to briefly mention is that. Uh, We've been doing quite a lot with um, finding ways to get data for this condition. Since you you want to, the human behavior is very heterogeneous. It's very stimuli dependent. So the more you find ways of getting this data somehow without uh, bothering humans, the better. So in this work, we use the properties of uh, human visual processing, what is known in behavioral science and vision science about how we look at certain stimuli. Uh, we encoded that we wrote Python scripts that allow you to generate that kind of data based on publicly available stimuli. And we've demonstrated that 
You can use this data to train uh, classifiers. Uh, uh, you use this data as a core and then you fine tune on someone's own data and this works well. So this is a way of uh, training eye movement based classifiers without having to collect uh, large amounts of uh, human data for specific uh, conditions. So in summary, um, this is uh, AR. AR is in a truly, truly exciting uh, space right now. We are, there's so much progress being made in content generation. There is so much potential in the space. Uh, this release of new headsets is uh, truly exciting. And uh, it's exciting to see how much, uh, how much investment is happening across different lines of uh, uh, the community. So there's, uh, there's an ARPA age program that's focused on AR, there is a DARPA program that's focused on AR. So this is really exciting uh, time for the space. Uh, we still need a lot of work to get these things to work well. Uh, you still have uh, failures in spatial awareness and semantic awareness. And arguably, a lot of this goes deeper than just creating. Uh, this requires science. Uh, so Jesse and I went to this immerse uh, to UIUC's uh, Center for Immersive Computing gathering recently. And part of their white paper is that the science of immersive system design does not yet exist. And I sign on to that statement that the fundamental science of computer systems work here has yet to be established. There are exciting opportunities for user context aware, aware apps uh, across a range of applications. And I want to say yet again that uh, we are looking for people to join us in realizing this uh, vision. So thanks to my students, and we have two minutes left. Thank you. I have a very general question. So in the last research, you were talking about how to use AR to change the way people live or intervene the way people live. Like you see, they get distracted, you push them back to work. I was wondering, like generally, how do you see AR and VR change the way people work and live? So, uh, this is, so, so the question, if I understand it correctly, how will AR change how you work and live? Um, so in work, there is a lot of uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, shall we say specialties. So for instance, uh, in in physiotherapy, there 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 is ways that they, it will change how physiotherapists do their job. Uh, there are there are. Uh, <clears throat> What I'm saying is that there are there are a lot of changes that uh, that will be field specific. So it's difficult to answer this question since they truly are dependent on the field. Uh, it uh, it uh, I think I think of it in terms of uh, again bringing bringing the information you need where you need it. So in terms of. Uh, 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 this is, this is the idea from um, from my collaborator who is a psychiatrist that uh, you you can use it to manage uh, suicidal ideation that you can uh, if you detect that somebody is suicidal or if you know that they're suicidal then you can tap into their values and you can demonstrate things for them that will uh, uh, that will address it in a way that is meaningful to them and that could be different for different people so I don't know if I'm I don't have a general answer but uh, I think there, there is potential for transformative change across many domains, if that helps. Thank you. Great, well, in the interest of time, maybe we'll end here and we'll thank the speaker again. Well, congrats on cooking.